Uh, thanks, George. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to start with a, a confession. Uh, a little while ago, I watched all five, episodes, uh, five series of Breaking Bad back to back. Um, I'm not proud of it. You know, it's 50 hours of my life I'll never get back. Not in the daytime, I'm not that bad. But, uh, but it's so addictive. You know, it's so addictive, that programme. But I was really amused to find that uh, two of the main characters, their names have become popular children's names. Jesse and uh, Skylar. Well, not Walter, for some reason or other. Um, and Skylar is a great name. I mean, it's a real futuristic name. And I can imagine Skylar coming home from school in a few years' time saying, Mummy, I've decided what I'm going to do when I, uh, I grow up. Um, I'm going to become an operative neuromodulator. I think, well, that's very impressive, Skylar. Um, if she's very switched on, she'll know that what Skylar's referring to is the implantation of electrodes deep in the brain, uh, a practice started in the 1980s, and if you continuously stimulate, then some movement disorders improve um, with that. But then in 1999, uh, in Belgium, somebody said, maybe that would work with OCD, maybe we'll, we'll try that. And since then, there's been a flurry of activity in this area, summarised in this book which was a bit of a shock when I saw the title, because when I was training in the uh, 70s, early 80s, psychosurgery was kind of a dirty word, you know. It was like the, 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 the height of medical arrogance and, and oppressive psychiatry. Um, it was like the Nazis in Germany. You, know, you didn't like to think about it, really. So it was a bit of a surprise. But it's written by a Frenchman, so you've got to cut him a bit of slack. Um, and um, in it, I read something really interesting. Now that deep brain stimulation means the surgery is reversible, we no longer have to worry about permanent harm. On the other hand, now that psychosurgery could be readily available, potentially for a large number of conditions, we have a lot more to worry about. When George asked me if I'd like to uh, talk about anything, I've been doing some work on a historical project uh, related to neuroscience in the 40s and 50s, and uh, psychosurgery kept coming up, and I was sort of immersed in a lot of this stuff. And I realized that this year is the 80th anniversary of the first prefrontal leucotomy. And one thing we know about people is that we repeat our mistakes, don't we? So maybe we should bite the bullet and look at psychiatry's holocaust in a way uh, again, and that's what I offered to do, and George has invited me here to, to, to do that. I immediately regretted it, because it's a very emotive subject. People have written lots of stuff from all different angles. How do I do justice to that in half an hour? I can't, in the end, I decided. So what I'm going to do is tell you three stories and read a poem. Not one of mine, I had. So these are the names of my uh, stories. So if you're all sitting comfortably, I'll begin. Second World War, between August 1940 and April 1941, Bristol became one of the most bombed uh, cities in the UK. Over 1,200 people died, thousands of buildings were, were destroyed. Into this scenario enters this man, VB. What we know about him is that he was a World War I veteran, um, a labourer by trade. Although he had minor injuries in the First World War, Physically, his psychological injuries were much more severe. He described himself as a nervous wreck. Um, and although he married and had children, it didn't make for a very good husband uh, or father or employee. Because he had chronic anxiety problems, he had chronic nightmares, was generally a solitary person, and even was unemployed for quite long periods. However, he was working as a labourer, and after a daylight raid, he helped to clear up an air raid shelter that had been hit. Now, I don't really want to imagine what that's like, but he didn't have to because he was a, a trenches veteran. Suffice it to say, he was acutely disturbed by this. He uh, was unable to eat or sleep for three days. For several weeks, he wandered aimlessly, as described, listening always for sirens, as you would. But he was also feeling a terrible coward because he was much more afraid than his wife and his children were of this. So finally, after 22 years, he was referred to psychiatry. And what they did was say, do you know, there's a new treatment just been introduced from America, and the only place in the UK you can get it is just a mile up the road. Would you like to be referred? Because it's a surgical treatment, I think they can help you. So I went to this place. <coughs> it was started up uh, for a charitable trust in 1939 um, to investigate brain disorders. It had the only neurosurgical theatre in the whole of the West Country. They went for a big hitter um, to run it, and this guy in the middle is called Frederick Goller, who is a... Um, Queen Square trained neurologist, became interested in shell shock during the First World War, and then for 15 years in the 20s and 30s ran the Central Pathological Laboratory at the Maudsley, which really meant they were in charge of research, teaching, um, and any investigations you did. He got a team around him uh, to come up to Bristol with him to start investigating the brain, but he didn't choose a clinical director at that time. He was very forward-looking, though. He chose this lady. She's called Effie Hutton. 
who was a, a London psychiatrist who'd had a, a number of publications. And it was Effie who VB saw when she was referred to the Maudsley, um, referred to the Bourbon. And um, she wrote the, the case up subsequently. So in, on February the 19th, 1941, he became the first man in the UK to have a prefrontal leucotomy. Under local anaesthetic, um, this was a, an account uh, that was given to somebody else at the time. He spoke the whole way through it. You wouldn't have known anything had been done. Um, the surgeon had a bit of advice. These were sort of publications at the time from America on how you go about this, uh, where to put the hole, what to do with your instruments. But unfortunately, there was a war on. They couldn't get these specialist instruments, so they had to improvise. This is actually the thing they used, um, a paper knife. Post-op, not surprisingly, he wasn't with it terribly well. He wasn't in a good state for a few days. But then, critically, he was indifferent to air aids. And he's lost his, his nightmares. So it's quite important, this, because one of the reasons to bomb Bristol is that had an aircraft factory, still does, and it's about two miles from the burden. So it, there were quite a few raids while he was there for two months, and it, he didn't buy it, he just slept through them. Um, he gradually became less indolent, was discharged in April, and returned to, week, uh, to work a week later. And when Effie wrote this up in the first eight patients in The Lancet in 1941, it was a success. Um, having, uh, having said that, she had reservations. And she gave her first talk about personality change in the end of 1941. So she returned to this in a number of papers over the years, increasingly with concerns about the, the after effects of this. For instance, VB longer term turned out to be very casual, somewhat a flaky employee, and uh, he didn't manage to stay in work. He was more disinhibited, so his wife said, he's impossible to live with. However, he said, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. You'd relieved him of these sort of anxieties. She contrasted him with M.W., slightly older man, better pre-morbid personality, if you like, more well-adjusted, uh, a uh, more responsible job. The war also freaked him out. It made him anxious, and then he developed uh, hypochondriasis, and then he developed a, a full-blown depressive illness. He was referred, initially, actually, this is incorrect, it was to free ECT. The burden was also the first place in the UK that gave ECT. But then in 1942, he had a leucotomy. Same technique. The difference here was that his employers were perfectly satisfied with him. And his wife said he's better than he's ever been. Not everybody shared Effie's reservations, though, because by 1947, 1,000 people in the UK had had uh, prefrontal leucotomies in this unmodified form. This was from a pamphlet. Border control ran psychiatry in those days. And um, they were fairly optimistic about the prospects of carrying on with this, and interestingly, in psychosis. So who started all this? Story number two. Almost certainly started here, the big hitters neurology conference in London in uh, 1935. One of the people come, who went there was this chap, who was professor of neurology in uh, Lisbon at the time. He had an interesting history. He trained in neurology in Paris, and then he became an MP, and through the war, he was Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Portugal. He even was involved in the armistice discussions. But Portugal became a dictatorship in the mid-20s, so we had to get out of politics or go to prison. And he went to Paris to see what was hot in the sort of research, and they said, oh, brain imaging. So he got to work, and uh, a year later, he became the first person ever to produce an angiogram. And he spent the next 20 years researching, produced maybe a couple of hundred papers on angiograms. And it was why he came to um, the conference to give a, t uh, a poster presentation about some of his work on angiograms. The next poster was an American, 20 years younger, also a neurologist, neuropathologist by training, ran a past lab in a, a big mental hospital in Washington, and he had a poster. They spoke English, but Freeman was uh, fluent in French as well, and they got on very well. And they spent a day together on a, a whole day session on the frontal lobes. First time they'd ever done this, this organization, and it included clinical presentations, it included uh, some animal work with chimpanzees particularly. And they were thrilled by this, particularly Monix, because it turned out he'd been thinking about the frontal lobes for uh, a couple of years. Because like a lot of neurologists at the time, he treated people with mental illness, middle class ones with depression. I mean, none of the treatments worked, and if you're going to see somebody who wasn't going to treat you effectively, you'd rather it be a neurologist than a psychiatrist, wouldn't you? I mean, it stands to reason. And, but he was struck by people with chronic depressive illness and obsessive-compulsive problems and anxiety, and he 
came to a neurologist's conclusion was that mental illness results from abnormally stabilised th thoughts marked by fixed neural pathways. This was his conclusion. And he looked to heroes like Kayal, who is a neuroanatomist, and Pavlov saying, there must be pathways, probably at the base of the frontal lobes, between the prefrontal area and the thalamus, um, that are causing this. So if we could suppress certain psychological complexes by destroying the cells, that would be a great step forward. And after his conference on the 12th of November 1935, that's exactly what he did. He persuaded a, a psychiatric colleague to refer him a patient, a 63-year-old lady with depression and paranoia, who'd been inpatient for a while, he persuaded a young surgeon to help out, and what they did was to drill holes in the top of this lady's head and inject absolute alcohol deep into her frontal lobes. And he was very impressed by the result. So he carried on, got a series of 20, but halfway through, he decided maybe this alcohol thing that they used for peripheral nerves, you want to damage them, wasn't working, he needed an instrument, so he invented one called his Leucotome, and it's illustrated on a commemorative stamp, because in 1949 he got the Nobel Prize for medicine for this. This was his conclusion that uh, agitated melancholia, acute anxiety, tenant were recovered or improved. Long-stay patients, these were. Whereas schizophrenia mania were a little bit improved. It wasn't so successful. And he wrote this up in French, and he kind of wisely sent his young colleague off to present the paper to the French neurologist and psychiatrist. And it didn't go down well. Because you weren't used to doctors coming to tell you they've just damaged 20 of their patients' brains. Most damning was this chap who turned out to be the person who referred the first poor four patients anyway. He's professor of psychiatry in Lisbon. He says, this is based on no more than cerebral mythology. You have no evidence that these pathways are what you say they are. And anyway, after four patients, he was rather worried about the way these patients were looking. So uh, Monitz had actually been to somebody else for the patients and got his own psychiatrist to assess them. So there was controversy there. Another one said... Malaria, th malaria therapy, the only effective treatment, by the way, at that time in psychiatry. Uh, insulin therapy were inspired by clinical findings. By contrast, no one has ever seen an organ improve its function after a hazardous mutilation. But Monitz translated his paper, uh, or had it translated into Italian and Spanish, and within a year, there were operations in these areas, and particularly Italy. He was invited for a two-week holiday in Italy to show three hospitals how to do it, which he gratefully did. But he also sent his paper in French, to Walter Freeman. And Walter was very impressed by this because they have a light mind. He published a summary in an American journal and he found his own surgeon, uh, a guy called James Watts, and they did their own series. And halfway through, they thought, oh, this fiddly thing, monics that goes wrong, let's do something a bit simpler. And so they devised their own uh, form of prefrontal leucotomy, dividing these fibers of the frontal lobes. And he also found that it wasn't based on diagnosis, it was based on, they thought people with worry, apprehension, anxiety, sleeplessness, nervous tension, these had a tendency to subside after the operation, but he was very cautious. The indiscriminate use of this procedure will result in vast harm. It should be reserved for a small group of specially selected cases. But not everybody agreed for this reason. This postcard is of Washington State's um, flagship mental health facility. Built in the early 30s, it had 10,000 beds. 10,000 patients for which there were no effective treatment. Now imagine you're maybe one in 20 who's particularly disturbed, a disturbed ward. What was that like? This was quite a humane place. Not everywhere was like that. These photos are not from the Holocaust. Well, not the Jewish one anyway. These were from an expose in Life magazine in 1946. This was the mental hospital in Cleveland, Ohio the disturbed wards. How much worse could you get than this, was the question they asked. We know that this procedure modifies behavior, damps down behavior. Surely it should, we should at least try for these, because these people don't have any, any hope. And so people did try, and surprise, surprise, they became less disturbed. They came out of disturbed wards. They, became, they came, uh, were discharged from hospital. People had been in for, for years. There was opposition, there was reservations, but not from the press. This was, wow, this was heroic medicine. This change from relief of anxiety, of emotional distress, to control of unwanted behavior. This is one of the sort of balanced headlines that uh, 
appeared in the press at the time, and the, the doctors were, this is a photograph, this, you know, the heroic doctors now fighting the mind with, with surgery. Um, and it was pretty much almost uniformly positive, it seems, the press at the time for this. And so that further encouraged the development of this thing. Well, Walter Freeman wasn't going to be left behind. He kind of changed his views with this, really. And he could have been in advertising because he was very good with words. So eventually he said this, personality can be cut to measure, sounding a note of hope for those who are afflicted with insanity. More cleverly, these damaged people, what we do, we give them a surgically induced childhood. We give them a second childhood. Who wouldn't want that? Uh, what about the opposition? Well, mainstream psychiatry was quite a reservation. What about psychoanalysis? Well, this was also in Life magazine. This is a couple of uh, cartoons explaining psychoanalysis. So here we have the well-adjusted person, um, the superego, the executive functioner, the, the id, the ego, all functioning together in a balanced way. And this is the maladjusted person. Superego has gone berserk. Um, so what would leucotomy do for this? It can free you from this oppressive superego. But of course, you'll need help to get yourself back together. And this wasn't opposed to psychotherapy. In fact, you need psychotherapy. You need ego resynthesis. Uh, and they even went more technical. I'll let you read that in a minute. Well, who could disagree with that? Another thing by Freeman. This is his very important textbook at the time on, on this subject. Read the last chapter to find out how those treasured frontal lobes, supposed to be man's most precious possession, can bring him to psychosis and suicide. A very balanced approach. Uh, Effie was a little bit more restrained. In certain pathological conditions, the frontal lobes impair rather than enhance the efficiency of the individual and play an important part in symptomatology. There's also a very different attitude to the brain and brain plasticity. This was Goller. Until such time as we realize the almost infinite ability of the CNS, we shall find ourselves outwitted by the recuperative powers of the damaged nervous system. Or Walter, eh, the brain can take a good deal of manhandling. But Walter, he was the initiator of this in America, but he had a problem. Every operation cost about $500. He liked to see himself. This is Pinel freeing the mentally ill in, in uh, Paris from their chains. And he knew there were thousands of people languishing there. That they were never going to get anywhere near them. Something had to be done, and he had a stroke of genius. He re remembered that to get to the frontal lobes, the easiest way is actually through the orbit, the thinnest part of the bone in the skull. And people had done this in investigation and even in an early form of leucotomy. So he was, remember, he worked in a pathological lab. He did post-mortems amongst other things. So he had access to bodies. So he practiced with lumbar puncture needles, little hammer. They snapped or they bent, so that wasn't any good. Eventually, notoriously, he found the solution in his kitchen drawer, the ice pick. Um, not only that, but in January, February 1946, he persuaded a patient, not a long-stay patient, a private patient, quite well healed, the, the lady called Ellen, who was the daughter of a jeweler, um, the wife of a jeweler, with a chronic, depressive, agitated state, to let him proceed. But the other bit of genius here was that he, ECT had become an office procedure. You give two episodes of this, two applications, no anaesthetist, and you'd be stunned for four minutes, long enough to do the procedure. Tears, largely sterile. You don't even need an operating theatre. And so with Ellen, he was a bit cautious. He did one eye one week and the other eye the next week. And amazingly, she recovered and even bought him a watch when she started working later on. But it encouraged him to carry on uh, with this procedure called his transorbital lobotomy. He was a showman, and he used to demonstrate this to groups. Not surprisingly, some people would faint and they'd be kind of amused by this. If you see this on Antiques Roadshow, that's what this horrible thing was for. Not over the next 20 years, that was his mission, going around backwards, performing this operation. He could do it in six minutes in the end. And um, it's reckoned he did about 3,000 of these before a lady finally, on her third, had a brain hemorrhage and he was prevented from doing any more. It included 20 children, incidentally, one of who wrote a very interesting book about his experiences. But the idea of doing less and less damage to try and get the benefit was what lots of people focused on. And that's what all of these were over the next 20 years developed. Most controversially, perhaps these, which are aimed directly at abnormal behavior, aggression, and particularly popular in Japan and in um, uh, India. 
course, the thing that stopped people operating on people with schizophrenia was this stuff, chlorpromazine, came out. And initially, it was even marketed as a chemical leukotomy as part of the sort of selling point of it. What about adverse effects? Well, it's very clear between 3 and 25% of people who had this died. 25% was Norway, actually, um, the initial series. Epilepsy is about 10%. Of course, urinary incontinence happened, disinhibition, impaired drive, all the things you'd expect. Weight gain. Estimated numbers, well, in the States, something over 40,000. In the UK, over 17,000. Not in the USSR. They used it as a propaganda tool. This is what the oppressive capitalists do to you if you don't conform. And not in Nazi Germany, because between 40 and 41, they euthanized 70,000 psychotic and learning disabled people. The most, youth, uh, the most uh, leukotomized area in the world was Scandinavia, amazingly. And the most country there was Sweden. And when that happened, there was usually a champion, a product champion. And here it was a guy called Gustav Rylander, who took his job very seriously. He, he wasn't like gung-ho. He, he did the most detailed follow-up studies. He realized that the psychological tests weren't really capturing the deficits that were happening in these people. And so he even employed a cook who'd had a leukotomy, so that he can observe it in more detail. And he was also one of the first people in 1947 to give detailed um, subjective accounts of what it was like from families, not just all this sort of distant medical statistics. One case particularly stuck out. A lady who had a religious mania, they called it then. She was obsessed with the Holy Ghost, that she was constantly talking about the Holy Ghost. Oh, I've sinned against the Holy Ghost. What, what's going to happen to me because of the Holy Ghost? So she had a leukotomy. What was the outcome? When the operation was finished, she was quite silent. I asked her, how are you now? What about the Holy Ghost? Smiling, she answered, oh, the Holy Ghost? There is no Holy Ghost. I don't know why I find that chilling, actually, but other people did as well. There's a very really, relatively little religious opposition to all this until the Scientologists got their uh, hands on it. She, they also use these sort of terms. She, families might remark, she's with me in her body, but her soul is in some way lost. And gradually there became a, uh, what became a snowball effect of opposition as you got through the 50s and then through the 60s to, to uh, these procedures, and for them being less and less used until by the 1970s it was really, virtually uh, extinct. So my last story. Um, in November 1958, five men, uh, a doctor, a surgeon, three scientists, were flown to Norway by the American military. Cold War funding of neuroscience is a whole other subject of a lecture. It's very interesting, though. This chap is called Harry Crow. Uh, he's actually also the reason we're here, because he inspired me to come into neuropsychiatry 25 years after this. What they were doing there was to visit a chap who'd just come back from the Mayo Clinic, where he'd been uh, working on this project. Now, if we look at the title, if I'd shown you that 25 minutes ago, you'd probably have been shocked. So 90 psychotic patients had electrodes inserted in the head, a, a technique that was developed to investigate epilepsy. Each of these has eight different electrodes of ever shorter length, so it's an array of 64 electrodes. And what they wanted to do is both to treat epilepsy at the burden, but also to look at intractable uh, mental illness in a less destructive way than was still being prevalent in 1948. And the second person to have this done was a lady called Rose. What they would do is pass a little current down one of these electrodes to deactivate that little bit of brain temporarily and see whether the patient had any uh, improvement. And I'm pretty sure this is the first episode of neuromodulation in the UK. Because when they found one that worked, then what they would do then, they couldn't leave the electrodes in, they would coagulate it, produce a minimum amount of damage. And she'd been in hospital for two years, she'd had a, uh, a fairly torrid past, including psychotherapy and, and drugs. And she, she managed two year follow up was that she was out of hospital, she was functioning at a much better level. But this too fell out of favour. So let's get back to the future. 50 years on, what you do now is you do a functional MRI scan, and in something like chronic depression or OCD, certain areas are overactive. If you put an electrode there and you pass a tiny current, you can deactivate it. Exactly the same method as way back then. This is one. Uh, protocol that's been used now. The herbenula is a small area at the back of the thalamus, deep in the brain. And this is the first patient to have an electrode implanted uh, with chronic depression who got relief when she had her 
electrical stimulation. So back to the book. So quite a cautious or sceptical afterward by a, a professor of functional neurosurgery at Queen Square at the end of it. What he said is this. Since 1999, there have been eight published targets for deep brain stimulation in OCD. Ten in Tourette, nine in depression. Despite this lack of consensus, deep brain stimulation is now being trialled for drug addiction, anorexia nervosa, PTSD, dementias, how on for enhancement of cognition in normal people. The last, uh, which kind of references what George is talking about in a way, um, it references a book in French called uh, Welcome to Transhumanity. That is, the augmented human is linked into this sort of area. But then he goes on to say what something which I guess is, if there's a take-home message from today, other than a general impression, it's this. Neuromodulation should not be allowed to become neuromanipulation, which essentially is what happened with the old story. That's some of the books that I reference. I've got the papers if you are interested. So now I poem to end up. Um, when I was 19, I, I went to a poetry reading by this chap, and I was very impressed because he was um, uh, a full-time doctor in London all the way through his career, but also published poets. Penguin modern poets, very impressive. And if I'm honest, he read a poem which has influenced my whole feeling about this area ever since, so I'm going to end with it. His older brother was also a doctor, and while he was a house surgeon in Wales, he assisted in an operation with um, a surgeon called Lambert Rogers, who by coincidence operated at the Burden in neurosurgery during the war. Something happened which was quite vivid, and Danny Absey wrote a poem about it. It's in the theatre. Sister saying... Soon you'll be back to the ward, sister thinking, only two more on the list. The patient saying, thank you, I feel fine. Small voices, small lies, nothing untoward. Though soon he would blink again and again, because of the fingers of Lambert Rogers, rash as a blind man's, inside his soft brain. <coughs> if items of horror can make a man laugh, then laugh at this. One hour later, the growth still undiscovered, ticking its own wild time, more brain mashed because of the probe's braille path. Lambert Rogers desperate, fingering still. His dresser thinking, Christ, two more on the list, a cisternal puncture and a neural cyst. Then suddenly, the cracked record in the brain, a ventriloquist voice that cried, you sod, leave my soul alone, leave my soul alone. The patient's dummy lips moving to that refrain. The patient's eyes too wide and shocked. Lambert Rogers drawing out the probe with nurses, students, sister, petrified. Leave my soul alone. Leave my soul alone. That voice so arctic, that cry so odd, had nowhere else to go, though the antique gramophone wound down and the words began to blur and slow. Leave my soul alone to cease at last when something other died and the silence matched the silence under snow. Thank you. Thank you.